I'm asking you for your trust. You need to tell me what you want, and then I'm going to do it to you. Ooh. And you're going to like it. Oh, my gosh. Yes. <laughs> Wait, and, and how? And, uh, sorry, I'm flustered. I'm flustered. I'm flustered. <laughs> Hello there, I'm outside. Can I hear you? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hello! Hi. How are you? I'm good. Oh, there's this beautiful spot. <gasps> wow, it's gorgeous. Are there two of them? The neighbors were helping. Yeah, just me, just me. Matt, nice to meet you. Good, how are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I feel like I already know you guys, but I'm, I'm watching the content and stuff, and so I feel like I already know you, but nice to, nice to officially meet. Okay, first take with Daddy. You like to go by Daddy, right? Yeah, you can call me Daddy. I like, I'll be your Daddy. I like that. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me at this place. It's so gorgeous. And I'm glad you like it. I was so excited to talk with both of you, and definitely interested in your past with your sex work and everything, too, because I do a lot of episodes with sex workers, and... I love them all so much. So inspired by like the entrepreneurship of a sex worker and mm. the self-starterness of having to start their own business, figure out their prices, figure out how to screen people. Like all of that really inspires me. Well, I kind of just fell into it. I didn't intend to. I started doing videos when I was 20 to pay for college because I was into it. I was into bondage porn. And so I did that for a company called Zeus. When I graduated college though, uh, I toured Europe as a college graduation gift and I met this guy who owned a sex store in Amsterdam and he uh, just bought Drummer Magazine in San Francisco. Mm. And because he knew my video work, he said, we're looking for a store manager in San Francisco, would you be interested? Then it just kind of snowballed from there. Uh, VHS tapes were selling in the 90s for like $80 a title. People were calling the store because they weren't even advertised right. It was just title price, title price. No pictures, no description. People were dropping $500 because there was no there was no internet, there was nothing you could watch. So I just started tapping into that and so I started directing my own and then I started my own distribution company for VHS tapes and then it just kind of snowballed from there. My directing got better, um, a big name company Falcon hired me uh, to direct their videos and I learned a lot. They were very big productions. Mm -hmm. We had $30,000 budgets per movie. Mm -hmm. Unheard of now. That's how much money was going into in the 90s. But now I feel like just like you do it yourself and that's what makes more money than actually like a studio. You know what's ironic is I made more money as an actor in 1992 than actors make today. I was making six hundred to a thousand dollars, and now you're lucky if you make three hundred. Three hundred dollars. That's l l less than you can make it like a serving shift at a restaurant. Exactly. <laughs> so. well, why would someone be enticed to get into adult films? now with that kind of price well what is different now I, I you'll see that studio has gone away because no one's buying that anymore it's always evolved and shifted so from vhs it went to dvd then it went to the internet and now it is in the fan site so now the model is in control of their own image for the first time and they have a production uh equipment in their pocket we didn't used to have that we used to have like huge cameras and lights and stuff and now this has made it very accessible for people to do on their own how do you feel about that coming from the studio sets and the big lights and the big cameras that now it's kind of Completely done a 180. I like it. I mean, I didn't. I didn't expect to at 55 to still be doing mm -hmm. in front of the camera, mm -hmm. uh, for one. Uh, but I like that. I own all my own shit that I produce. Um, I have complete control over my image, uh, and then my history of knowing how to light and shoot really just helps me. So I think people coming up, they need to learn some of the basics to make their the quality of their footage better. Uh, and then that'll make them stand out. So this is your place, right? Yes, this is my place. And it doesn't normally like, look like this. We just pulled the couch from over there, over here, because we thought it, you wouldn't want to shoot into the window because the light will suck. I love you already thinking, like, I love filming with content creators because you already get it. You already understand the vibe. Does that look good? I look good. Do you look good? I've decided that I look great. I could wish for nothing else. 
So you guys don't live together? No. He, uh, Amp lives two blocks, two down. blocks down. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, it's not too bad. It was great during COVID. Because you had two spots? We had our own spots. Oh, yeah. <laughs> our own, because both of our spaces are different studios. So I've got my streaming, and he does his own sex worky stuff here. So it's, it's nice to have our spaces there. How long have you guys been together for now? Nine years. Nine years? Wow. I know, too long. No, that's goals. Honestly, like that's what I feel like most of us are looking for. Nine years, like in, in the gay world, that's so many years. You know what I mean? That's... We're very old, thank you. No, yeah. How, how old? Because you, you look. How old are you? You're you're young. I mean, you're both young, but you are definitely 21. No, 34. Because you're my age, yeah. 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 So nine years. Wow. Good for you guys. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, my dad thought I was having a midlife crisis. Did he? Yeah, for sure. Why? Because you're dating someone younger, or what? Twenty-four. Yeah. Oh, and how? And how you're you're young too. How old are you? I'm fifty-five. I'm not that young. You, you look great. Thank you. And you're hot, so it doesn't even matter. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. You're forgiven. As I came here, I was walking around the Castro district and just really soaking it in. And I thought about you know our history here and you know the AIDS epidemic here and you coming here in 1992. What what was that like for you? Pretty much, it was at the height of the AIDS epidemic, right? It was a lot of fear at that time, uh, but it was also a lot of, we have nothing to lose. We thought we were going to die. I came here like a lot of kids are now coming here. Uh, I came to get away from a religious home. San Francisco was a gay bubble. It still is. Um, so there was a lot of resources here. But yes, during the AIDS crisis, a lot of people um, came here because they thought they weren't going to make it. That's also where we had a lot of like ACT UP and other other uh, organizations that came here and fought for a lot of the civil rights that we have right now uh, because the administration was just ignoring us and ignoring AIDS. In the 1980s, the Reagan administration largely ignored the AIDS epidemic, which was rapidly spreading and devastating our community. Officials often dismissed the crisis due to the stigma surrounding the disease. This lack of response not only hindered scientific advancements, but also perpetrated fear and misinformation. A mystery disease known as the gay plague has become an epidemic unprecedented in the history of American medicine. There was a tremendous amount of homophobia. No one came to our defense except our own community. Just because my friends and I are gay, if we are affected by this disease, that no one really cares, that it seems that we deserved it, so let us die. The administration's inaction contributed to a prolonged public health disaster, leaving countless individuals without the necessary support and care. This audio you're about to hear is from a White House briefing in 1982, when journalist Reverend Lester Consolving asked the deputy the first public question about the AIDS epidemic. with this unbelievable circumstance of a community that in addition to being hated and under attack is now forced alone to try to figure out how to deal with this extraordinary medical disaster. And that's also where like Paul actually kind of stepped up and did this job and like started putting condoms. Falcon was the first one to put condoms on to promote safe sex and make it sexy and hot. It was really the advent of PrEP that the condoms came off again. And that was really hard for a lot of people because we had trained them that the only safe sex there was was with the condom. And now your generation has had prep for six, eight years. And now they don't even remember what it was like before a condom. I love talking to people that, you know, are a bit older than me because it's because of you guys and the fight that you have gone through that we are able to live the way we live. And I think so many people in my generation and people younger than us, take it for granted and don't really choose to learn about our history or choose to, you know, commend those that came before us. I agree with that, but it's also, um, there's not a lot of people teaching that history either. That's not taught in school. Um, so it's not only your generation's fault. Mm -hmm. 
um, right? And so, and right now, right now, your rights, are, all of our rights are on the chopping block and we don't realize it. We have, we fought for these rights that you now have, like gay marriage. That can go away still. Um, that, did you just see what happened to abortion? That could be swept away. And I think a lot of gay youth is living kind of with blinders on, thinking, oh, they'll never take that away from us. That's my right. Um, but those rights were fought for. And with a lot of blood, uh, they were fought for. So Chills hearing that. Yeah. I was just at Manchester Pride last year, and I was really moved because they had a candlelight vigil at the end to remember people who had passed. And I realized I haven't been to a candlelight vigil in eight years. That used to be an occurrence that happened every month candlelight vigils here in San Francisco. I really teared up because I thought about people I hadn't thought about in years and I really felt guilty about that uh, because a lot of our people died and a lot of amazing people died. Back in that time, was there a survivor's guilt? <sighs> I don't know if I would call it guilt. Some people were more overly cautious than others and everyone had their, just kind of like if you look at COVID, people had different coping mechanisms for it. Some people wore masks all the time. Some would just do it. They would take their masks off on the street, right? So you would have what you would consider safe for you guidelines. I came out in 90, so I knew that penetrative sex probably would transmit, uh, transmit HIV to me. So most of the sex I got into was bondage and jacking off. I didn't really do anal until I reached mid-30s truthfully, because I was scared. So everyone had their ways of coping and surviving. Was that part of the reason why you got into the bondage world? I mean, I was truly into bondage. I, I would go off to Wild Wild West when I was a kid, anytime he got captured. I don't even know if you know what Wild Wild West is. No, but I love it. I can imagine what it is, and I love it. I love it. James Conrad was super hot, and he'd always get captured, and they tear his shirt off, and, and I love that. I don't know if that was the main reason but it was something i definitely leaned into because i totally got off on getting tied up this room can change to anything mm -hmm. so usually the couch is over there the coffee table turns into a spank bench oh um, and so i do pro dom work out of here as well mm -hmm. so and then over here your basic puppy cage <sighs> this chair is oh my gosh here. i haven't even turned around yet to see this and then this is the bedroom, which I would have made my bed had I known you were going to come. No, oh, I love it. It's all part of the vibe. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and then this is the <gasps> Wow. That needs to be cleaned up. Oh, There's my gosh. There's a lot of toys and stuff going on. How long have you been collecting all this for? I've been doing it for 30 years, so a little bit. And these are expensive too, aren't they? Like all the leather and stuff? Expensive, yeah. Wow. Do you have a favorite one? Um, or one that you use the most often. That's like saying, which is your favorite baby? <laughs> uh, like, I love this chassis cage. They don't make this anymore. <gasps> that uh, looks like antique. This is 30 years old. It has a jock cut built in. Wow. Um, yeah, there's just, Gosh. There's a lot. I love the whole BDSM world. I love that we're, you know, in front of this. What I love a lot about the BDSM world is that it can be fun and exciting, but it's all very consensual. And there's like contracts that people talk about, you know, or or words or safe words. And it's a very safe space, but a place where you can still have fun. So most people think of BDSM as like a really harsh, scary place. Yeah. But if you really think about it, it's really the most trust you can have. Mm -hmm in the other person. You are trusting someone to be your most vulnerable, like literally tied it down. Mm -hmm. So what does that do when you trust someone that much? It's a bonding ex experience for you. And there's just because it's erotic, there are so many socially acceptable forms of BDSM in society. And I, I learned this once when I went to a, uh, a foot massage place and it was in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, they put us in this dark room in these big lounge chairs and I had never done this. I don't like people giving me massages. So I had never done this before, got in this massage chair and the first thing they put was a hot wet towel over my face. And I was like, huh, that's sensory deprivation. That's like putting a blindfold on someone. Mm -hmm. 
And is a room full of old women getting this done to them, right? They took my shoes and socks off, so they're undressing me. And the next thing I feel is my feet going in scalding hot water. And I was not prepared for that. <laughs> but my whole senses went, whoa, I totally woke up, right? That's BDSM. And then all of a sudden I felt rubber mallets hitting my legs up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. That's in back play. But this is just socially acceptable forms of it. But people pay for that. So this is my um, suspension rack. So this door frame. So like, if I wanted to hang the sling, I'd probably have to just go up here. Oh, fun! That looks comfy too. It's actually the, probably the most comfortable sling you'll ever be in. <gasps> Look at you go! Right. Oh my gosh, I love it. <laughs> Can I try it? Yeah. Will you hold the camera? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, hold on to the top. Like this, right? Don't want you killing yourself. And just jump on, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, oh. now, give me one leg. Okay. Scoot your butt down, all the way down. Okay. Come on, you've done this before. Now, one leg up. So, I'm take my shoes off, or is it? No, it's fine. Okay. There you go. Yes. Oh, now, I could, like, honestly sleep like this. I know. Actually, the puppy likes to play video games in it. This is his video gaming chair. The puppy, I love that. Yeah, there you go. <gasps> wow, this is a life. This yeah, is a life. for your escort work, we're, we're allowed to talk about this, yeah, right? You can talk about this. Okay, work. for your escort work, you this is prim like what you're known for, right? Yeah, so I've been doing this for quite a while. So, uh, I, I have a rent men account where people can hire me as a pro dom. And so, usually, the first question I ask is, What kind of scene are you looking for? Mm -hmm. Um, if it's just like a and suck that's really not my bag mm -hmm. so but if you want to experience bondage for the first time if you want to be tied down if you want to be spanked, if you want a flogging if you want sensory deprivation if you want to do electro i'm your guy mm -hmm. i know how to do that in a safe sane way that won't go past your limits because i'm good at reading body language mm -hmm. what i'm wondering about the bdsm court world is because there's so much communication that needs to happen before the actual bdsm mm -hmm. session how are you finding the boundaries with your clients when they're, you know, sending you message after message after message before any money has been sent to you? Sure. And that's where I go, what kind of scene are you looking for? And then they will tell me kind of a guideline. Once they're here, strip them down on the knees, and then we discuss what are you looking for? What can I do to you? That's hot. Yeah. This is when they'll be their most candid and open. Uh, texting is really hard for people, especially if it's not face-to-face. -face. But if you're looking someone in the eyes and you're going, I'm asking you for your trust. You need to tell me what you want. And then I'm going to do it to you. Ooh. And you're going to like it. Oh, my gosh. Yes. <laughs> Wait, and, and how? And, uh, I'm sorry. I'm flustered. I'm flustered. I'm flustered. <laughs> Let's turn this camera off. That'll be 250, please. Yeah, yeah, right, right. How, how did you get involved in the BDSM world? Because it can be, if you're untrained, it can be very dangerous. You know what I mean? So how yeah. do you make sure that you know what you're doing, that it's safe? Okay, so... I've taken many classes on shibari, rope work, and that kind of stuff, pressure points. You know, for the most part, uh, what is unsafe uh, in binding and that kind of stuff. Now, everybody is different, and everyone has different physical limitations. You need to ask those things up front and in person. Um, but a lot of it comes from just experience and trial and error. There's two different sets of... BDSM. Uh, there's um, RAC, which is risk aware consensual kink, mm -hmm. which means there's a little risk involved in what you're doing. I know what those risks are and I'm okay with it. And that's part of the reason why it's kind of hot. Yeah. And the other one is SSC, safe, sane, and consensual kink. Um, and that is where you negotiate everything up front. Which one do you prefer out of those two? I like RAC. I like pushing boundaries just a little bit mm -hmm. and being able to see when someone wants to be pushed and when they're not able to be pushed. Is there always a safe word involved? Yeah, you know, safe words are very important and they're not always used. That's part of the play too, yeah. right? If you're really good, then you won't have to use one. Is there a safe word and there's a safe word? Do you know what I mean? There's a safe word where I it's mean, like... The safe, way, the safe word should be the last thing. So you shouldn't need two. <laughs> you don't need a backup safe word. Or is there like a like, fake... really stop. <laughs> is there, yeah, is there like a fake safe word where it's like, oh no, stop. Oh, so, <laughs> so I see what you're saying. So you're thinking of CNC, which is consensual non-consent. You want to be like, don't stop. 
don't <laughs> stop. Oh, don't stop. <laughs> so, yes, uh, that has to be negotiated up front. Do you have a lot of clients that are coming and this is their first time into this world and this is that's why they're hiring you? Absolutely. Uh, because a lot of people are really scared to do this with their partners, too. And a lot of partners don't want to do it with you. Uh, a lot of partners have a hard time hurting someone they love, right? Even if their partner wants to be hurt. And also, I would feel like a lot of people maybe are scared to admit to their partners that this is something they're into. And so mm -hmm. they can come to you. There's and a little shame involved. When you, you, you different fetishes and kink, some people just of our background, background and upbringing are a little ashamed to admit what they're into. And they don't want to share it with their partner. You said you came from a very like religious and conservative family. Oh, yeah. Pentecostal Christian. Did you have shame involving this when you first got into it? Hmm, that's a very good question. Um, I was always into it. I left my mother in that home when I was 18. And then I never looked back. So I think I shed that shame right away. And then I was just like a kid in the candy store. I'm like, I'm doing what I want. Mm -hmm. Fuck that. Are you still close with your family and don't stuff? Don't talk to her. Don't talk to her. Since you left? No, it was about 10 years ago when, uh, yeah, she's, she's very religious. Think Sarah Palin. She acts, talks, looks like Sarah Palin. There's just no community. Very Trump supporter, right-wing Republican. It, there's just no good that can come out of conversations with her. Did she know that this is the world you're in too, too? I don't know. And I don't care. I love it. I think, I, <laughs> I think that sometimes there are boundaries that need to be had. You know what I mean? No, especially if they're unsafe and unhealthy for you. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of people on my channel that have come to that terms with their family and realized that, you know, as much as it's their family or whatever, it's like it's not healthy for them to have them in their lives anymore because they're not accepting of who they are. No, and that's why a lot of queer youth and a lot of uh, queer have chosen families. Uh, we make and create our only own families that accept us for who we are. Do you talk about prices with your score business? Oh, yeah, always up front. Are you, no, are you public about that? Oh, I, d I don't put it in my ad, but when they contact me, I'll tell them the price. Okay, got it. I was yeah. curious if you want to talk about that on this, but okay, perfect. No, I mean, I don't care. Oh, you want to know how much? <laughs> I'm, I'm nosy. I'd like to know. Do you mind? $300 an hour. Okay, that's, that's good. Yeah, no, I, I hope so. How do, you, how do you figure that price out? Time. It, it, it's really negotiating what I have t actual time for. I'm kind of a busy guy with everything else we got going. Um, and I'm choosy about clients. I, I don't have to do this. At this point, I do it almost, and it sounds weird, like a community service. Hmm. As a, I, I turn down a lot of people. Really? Yeah, I don't have time. Do you have a lot of people coming to you that know of you from YouTube and stuff? And like, oh, I want to experience that. It's almost like they're like experience it with, you know... It's like a celebrity in their eyes. You know what I mean? Sometimes. Yes. And is that kind of hot for you or how do you feel? Mm, I don't think of it as hot or different. It's just, it's kind of like marketing in a way. Uh, at least they found me through that channel. That's what I was going to say earlier about when you're talking about porn, why people would do porn still nowadays. It is, it cross promotes, they do a studio porn, and then all of a sudden people are watching that and they want, <gasps> yeah. so they subscribe to Fans. Studios are very good about promoting a name, and their imagery is actually really good too. Mm -hmm. So, and they still have those algorithms out there that people still gravitate to. And so, I still do studio. And I do one or two a year, and that keeps my name in those channels. You are a vast of knowledge about this whole <laughs> world. Like, I think I could talk to you about an, an hour is about just your life in general and also the BDSM world and your upbringing. It's all just so fascinating. So really, thank you so much for opening up. No, thank you. This has been kind of fun. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, good. Awesome. I want to tie you up now. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh, really? <laughs> yeah. I love it. You might not leave. Okay, I'm turning this off. <laughs> I absolutely love spending time with Daddy. He is so wise and educational and it just makes such perfect sense why him and Amps job is essentially educating so many of us in the BDSM world in general. The follow-up episode will center on Amp's story as well as a sit-down with the both of them when we really dive deeper into the relationship. It's a really beautiful episode and I'll be releasing it in a couple days from now, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that. I loved spending time in San Francisco and it's actually so interesting that it's the first time that I've taken my show there because it's so rich with queer history and there are such interesting people there with such vast and complex and different stories that I am already looking forward to going back. And it's such an easy trip for me because I live in Los Angeles and my sister actually lives in San Francisco. She's a nurse there. So it's really it was really fun to go there and to get to stay at her place and, you know, to do like a hybrid of a work trip, but also to see my family and spend time with my sister and 
it was just a perfect situation. So if you live in San Francisco and I missed you this time around, make sure to email me if you want to be on the show and I will let you know when I have plans to go back. I am heading to Houston, Texas and to Nashville, Tennessee in the next couple weeks and I'm still looking for a couple stories and I still have a couple slots to fill. So if you live in either of those cities and you're interested in being on the show or you know somebody who does live in those cities and you think they would be a good fit make sure to email me a little bit about yourself your social media links and what city you live in out of the two and i will be sure to get back to you i believe i'll be in houston during houston pride so if you're going to houston pride make sure you keep a lookout for me and if you see me come up and say hi so i can give you a hug and meet you nothing makes me happier than meeting people that watch the show so if that is you i will see you soon i hope you're subscribed to the channel and i will see you in a couple days with a follow-up episode Okay, thank you so much. Have a good day.